Hello, and welcome to episode 24 of the continuing saga that is awesome astronomy. Reaching into your speakers and headphones like the all-pervasive presence that is the gravitational constant. And if you knew instantly that that was 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 meters cubed kilograms to the minus 1 s to the minus 2, then pass friend and be recognized. If you didn't, then shame on you, but stick around kid, you might learn something. <laughs> Now, we have an increase in zenithal hourly rate this month because joining me is not just the ever congenial, nay, even dare I say, jolly Ralph. Hey there. But I'm also joined by the recently house-trained Damien and the surprisingly sentient John. Felicitations, puny earthlings. Oh, yeah. Of course, why are we letting this pair of naked apes near the microphones again? Probably the question on all of your lips. Why are we letting these naked apes near the microphones again? Well, as you may be able to discern, we're outside again and once more walking amongst you mortals. It's the night of the 23rd of May 2014 and we're meteor hunting, specifically the possibility of a storm centred on Camelopar Dallas, caused by the debris trail of Comet 209P Linear. We could be looking at one of the most spectacular meteor showers of recent years if predictions hold true. So Ralph, as Mars is own wise woman of weather, how are prospects looking tonight? Well, the prospects are looking really good. We've been, well, we'll be talking about this in a moment, but we've had some radio detection equipment set up and we've been looking at the spikes on there even as it was light. And as it's getting darker now, the stars are popping out, the weather's looking fantastic in our location, and I hope it is, or was as you're listening to this, in the location that you're at, because we're now looking up as we're recording this, really quite optimistic that we, if there are any meteors going to be popping out, we're going to see them. Well, this is it is really looking fantastic. The, uh, the even the field stars are starting to pop out now. We are we are getting done. We're doing this under red light, in fact. Um, <laughs> the first so, time ever. For the first time ever. So it, there there will be more outtakes than usual. I feel. <laughs> um, and we've still got a few hours to go until we should really get into the the heart of this storm. So we're going to sit back tonight. We're going to talk astronomy, and we're going to see what we can see. And if you hear any oohs and ahs and, and squeals, then uh, that'll be because one of us has seen a meteor popping off in the distance, and it might mm. be disruptive, but um, we're going to enjoy ourselves anyway, aren't we? Absolutely. So, in the meantime, how has the world of astronomy been for you guys since we were invading the Herschel Museum last episode? Well, of course, we were lucky enough last month to be under the uber-dark skies of the Brecon Beacons again, along with many people out there that are listening to this podcast. And while it was a wet weekend, what a fantastic time we had. Um, new and old friends, talks and demonstrations, and of course, we were joined by the whole Sky Night team who filmed their May episode at the camp. Yeah, we had a lot of rain, but the social side of Astrocamp really stepped up to the mark, and for those with patience, the skies did eventually deliver. Um, we had some solar astronomy, mm -hmm. daytime views of Jupiter, and in the middle of the last night, we were treated to the very reason we make the trip and organise the camp. That sky. Mm. The Milky Way arcing over the horizon, those brighter deep sky objects and naked eye visible we we grabbed the current comet pan stars and john with his mahusive dobsonian bagged us mars's moon phobos which is a real triumph by any standard absolutely and of course john provided us with cosmic rays from his cloud chamber as well well a uh, fish tank dry ice and lots of alcohol did most of the work I mean, was, was it alcohol in the tank or uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, both sides of the glass? <laughs> both sides I think. of the glass. I think. <laughs> and throw in another successful pub quiz and a fantastic talk by Chris Lintot, which you'll be able to hear later in this episode. Mm, yeah, and it was a great weekend of astronomy fun. We're already taking bookings for next Astra Camp, which will be held on the twentieth to twenty third of September. Just visit the Awesome Astronomy site at www.awesomeastronomy.com and join in the fun. You, uh, you sounded just like Damien when you said that. It's uncanny. Anyway, before we head to the news, we should introduce the technological side of tonight's meteor hunt. John is currently fiddling with knobs and waving an antenna around like a latter-day <laughs> Bernard Lovell. John, what are you doing? We're trying to detect meteors uh, using radar reflections. Cool, and you've built this yourself? Yeah, there was a bit of help from uh, Astronomy magazine, uh, who this month have run an article on radio astronomy. So using instructions that I've borrowed from them, I've built a small radio telescope. And what have we seen so far? So far we've seen um, detections of approximately about 20 metres a minute, and there's some there now. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, look across, spiking. yeah, we're looking across, it's spiking well, isn't it? And you're also able to deduce the speed of these yeah. objects as well, weren't yeah. you? Yeah, by knowing the frequencies of the radar that we're observing the reflections from, you can calculate the speeds that the meteor is uh, travelling at. And what speed have we got so far? Uh, so far we've had about 14 kilometres a second. Excellent. 
Thank you very much, John. There must be, there must be meteors going. No, I've not seen any. I've I was, I was looking at. Uh, in fact, John's so been it's looking. Dark all enough time. now. Yeah. We can see field yeah. stars. Yeah. Come on. I've got a crick in my neck through looking up, but buggered if I've seen it. So it's great that we've been able to make these detections and we've also been able to judge the speed of these objects even before we were able to see them with our own eyes and Damien's also playing with the tech tonight and getting all imagery on us. Uh, what are you up to, Damien? Well, Ralph, I'm trying to give all our listeners in Claudia Climbs a view of the Camelopardalids via live stream. Unfortunately, we've had a few uh, technical problems here in the wilderness, um, so I've resorted to taking a time lapse instead. Um, we'll try and bring the uh, live stream to people uh, if we can resolve the, the technical issues, but um, hopefully we'll get some good footage of, uh, of the uh, meteor shower. Oh, iridium. Just flared up, gone down again. There it goes. What? Another iridium. Oh, did you see that? That was bright. Wow, that actually just flashed, didn't it? Yeah. As you can see it, it keeps coming in and out, doesn't it? As the it must be, yeah, it must be just catching... And there it goes again. Oh, that's wow. an awesome one. This guy's just missed the most awesome iridium flare. That flared three times. And one actually, and that, it, that, that middle one where it... It was just like a camera flash. Yeah. That was incredible. That was awesome. Okay, so while John twiddles his knobs and Damien makes imagery with the sky, it's time to look at what is up these past weeks in the universe we call Astro, Ralph. Well, first up, thank you, NASA. Thanks a bunch. Just a day after we recorded a rundown of the most interesting exoplanets for the last episode, the team that was working on the data from the planet hunting Kepler Space Telescope released the news that they'd found the most Earth-like planet outside our solar system. We missed out on it by one day. What were the chances of that? I'm speechless. I think they did it deliberately, frankly. Hmm, so we'll have to make them pay. So this planet that's just been found is a planet with the name Kepler-186f because it's the fifth planet out from the star Kepler-186, which sits 500 light years away in the constellation of Cygnus. And its name will change because a bit of insider info, which might be public now, I don't know, I've got dreadful memory, so I'll, I'll treat it as still under embargo, that way nobody gets angry at me. But I understand that a team's already working with the International Astronomical Union to work out the convention for less formal and confusing names for exoplanets. And given that there will be millions of these faraway planets known to us in a few decades' time, and then there'll be billions after that, there's going to be enough for everyone to have their own planet or three. So, Paul, you might actually get your Planet Dave. Planet Dave. You've been we, wanting a Planet we could Dave. Have, yeah, we solar. could have the entire Essex solar system. We should have... So you've got Planet Dave, you'll, there'll have to be a Planet Steve, Yeah. you'll have to have Sharon. a Sharon. Yeah. Definitely a Tracy. And the if it's a binary system, the, the bigger, yeah. angrier star could be the Uncle Frank with its white socks and sandals. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and the white van man asteroid belt. <laughs> sorry, Essex. <laughs> Home in the white stiletto. We're not sorry. No, we're not sorry. <laughs> we love you, really. So, what makes this planet so special then, Ralph? Well, it's not really. I mean, we don't know anything about it other than it's just inside the outer edge of the habitable zone. That's that region around its star where water can exist if it has a thick enough atmosphere. And we know that it's less than 10% larger than Earth, so we'd all weigh half as much again if we stood on that planet. But it's seen as special because it's the most Earth-like planet we've seen so far. And being close enough into its red dwarf star to orbit once every 129 days we can assume that it's a rocky world but we can't know for sure and we don't have any telescopes on the drawing board that'll be able to tell us its mass or, or even what it's made of or whether it has an atmosphere in the foreseeable future either and it could be tidy locked too couldn't it well, well it could be we just don't know it's close enough into its star that like the moon it could only show one face to the object that it orbits in this case its star you know it could have one side that's permanently scorching in the full glare of kepler 186 and another that's permanently in the shade yeah i mean that's just like sort of mercury and venus mm. in, in our solar system and i mean that could make some very extreme weather if indeed it does have an atmosphere um, and that would mean that perhaps there's only a thin uh, strip of surface where the light turns to dark and life might be able to live. 
Yeah, and it's it's not even around a star like our own either, because red dwarf stars are cooler than our sun, the habitable zone there is closer in than in our solar system, and this planet orbits about the same distance from its star as Mercury does in our solar system, which, as I said earlier, is actually because the star's cooler, it's actually on the outer edges of its habitable zone, a bit like Mars's temperature within our habitable zone, so roughly Earth-sized, but closer in and still much cooler than Earth. But we know Mars was habitable once before it lost its atmosphere to the solar wind, and Kepler-186f, being more massive than Mars or the Earth, makes it, well, better equipped to hold on to any atmosphere it might have through gravity. So this could well be the Earth analogue we've been desperately hunting for. It's certainly the best candidate we've found so far. But we're going to find better and better candidates as the years roll on. Yeah, we're always finding better candidates. Year on year we find planets that are smaller, more Earth-like in size, and more and more that are falling out of the Kepler data that are within their habitable zones. And we're looking for this right combination. But really what we want is something that's nearby enough. And we're talking probably a couple of dozen light years away, rather than 500 light years away like this star system. We want something that's closer so that when probes like the James Webb Space yeah. Telescope can actually get out there and I think we're, we're talking about 2018 yes. still when it's yeah. when it's due to be launched this has got the 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 tantalizing prospect of being able to analyze the atmospheres of, of planets that are a few light years away and it'll just be so intriguing to have these list of planets that it can go and actually sniff out the atmospheres to look for these key biomarkers we want methane and oxygen and particularly ozone Mm. things that give us a good indication that there could be life in some form or another on that planet yeah we mustn't get carried away thinking though that every planet we find in habitable zone of its sun is going to harbor life though Oh yeah, that's right. I mean, with all the excitement over exoplanet discoveries and astrobiology news articles, it's so easy to get carried away and assume that we only need to find these Earth-sized worlds in their habitable zones and bingo. But while we're finding water and organic materials existing almost everywhere, Venus and Mars show us that it's just not as simple as all that. Yeah, though both might once have harboured simple life, um, bacterial, simple organisms. Yeah, I mean, maybe once, but any exoplanet hunting alien looking in our direction would Mm. see three Goldilocks planets in our solar system with Venus on the inner edge of our habitable zone, Mars on the outer edge, and Earth between the two. So that's three to get excited about, but there's only one sending radio signals out around the clock that could be picked up by a technologically advanced civilization. Yeah. So that begs the question, what about SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence? I imagine they're all over this. Yeah, they are actually. They trained their radio scopes on this star system for a month and they listened to every frequency in the 1 to 10 gigahertz window twice. Yeah, that's where Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, satellite phones operate here, but it's where the fewest natural galactic radio signals are found. Yeah, yeah, that's right, and that makes it ideal to scan for engineered radio signals from any technological civilizations if they're out there. But unfortunately, they didn't find anything. Or fortunately, if you're scared of the Borg or Predator version of possible (laughs) space aliens. but (laughs) Yeah, let's not forget that with all these new exciting planets starting to drop out of the data, and I think we can realistically expect a lot more, despite the Kepler planet hunting telescope no longer functioning, SETI must be absolutely beside themselves at actually being able to point to specific Earth-sized planets rather than having to conduct random sky surveys. Yeah, and then to add to the mix, there's all those new exoplanet hunting scopes in development, like NASA's Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite and ESA's Planetary Transits and Oscillations of Stars Observatory. And you'd have to say that we are really in the golden age of exoplanet hunting. Yeah, yeah. I saw something really bright over there. It looked like it was going at kind of a bit faster than iridium flare speed, but not fast enough to be well, a meteor. Not, they're not really bright. Well, they're not particularly fast meteors. No, they're not. It, it was really bright, I would say. Oh. Not quite. Uh, it might have been actually. It might have. Yeah, I would say it probably mm-hmm. was fireball brightness. About, v- about Venus. About the I saw something at the yeah. Of my eye. yeah. I thought I saw the second one as well. Yeah, it was low on the horizon. It was kind of. Just above the tree. Like there. Yeah. So it was going away from us. Yeah. So is a camelopard dallied. So that's Earth 2.0. But I think we need to have a word with Jupiter next. 
Yes, um, this is bad news for backyard astronomers because Jupiter's great red spot, that gigantic high pressure storm that could easily swallow up the Earth, is getting more difficult to see. Um, this is a storm that's been raging on Jupiter for at least 350 years because, well, this is actually the 350th anniversary of Robert Hooke discovering the great red spot on Jupiter in 1664. A great year for those who appreciate astronomy and premium French lagers, but how long <laughs> the storm was raging before 1664? Before, we just can't say. Uh, I can confidently say that the Great Red Spot's been getting less red, more pink and less pronounced in my lifetime as I've been observing it, certainly. Yeah, you've been saying that for a few years now and we know that it's gone from 41,000 kilometres wide at the turn of the 20th century to 23,000 kilometres in 1979 when the Voyager spacecraft got a nice up-close view of it. But we can now tell from multiple Hubble images and amateur observations that it's just 16,500 kilometres across now and it appears to be shrinking by almost 1,000 kilometres each year. So that's terrible news if this is the storm coming to an end. Yeah, that would really be bad news. It's definitely one of the most rewarding things to see in a telescope yeah. and a real showstopper. I mean, when you show someone Jupiter the first time and can tell them that they're seeing a storm that's bigger <laughs> than the Earth, hey, do we know what's causing it to shrink? Well, not really, no. I mean, th there are a lot of smaller storms that swirl around the Great Red Spot and often merge with it. And you can also see these smaller storms in large amateur telescopes and amateur images. But rather than making the Great Red Spot bigger, it's thought that the smaller storms could be altering the internal dynamics and either making it less visible in Jupiter's upper atmosphere or causing it to lose energy and slowly disappear from the edges in. It's actually getting less oval shaped and more round as it shrinks too. Yeah, so the message there really has to be go out and take a look while it's still visible in the west and as it rises again in the east in January because at this rate it'll be gone in 16 years and probably only still visible with amateur scopes for another 5 to 10 years. Yeah, not a great way to celebrate its 350th anniversary. Yeah. So finally, we're bringing this close to home. Well, our listeners home anyway. Yeah, last up a report on the melting of ice sheets and global warming came out this month from researchers at NASA and the University of California, Irvine, that really just heaped more bad news on the state of ice melting and sea level rises from the South Pole, or more specifically Antarctica. So as well as the research NASA does above the atmosphere, they also have a barrage of satellites and experiments to explore and assess the oceans, um, atmospheric contents and land movement from mudslides and earthquakes and a whole load of other stuff that has a more terrestrial focus. But while it had been understood that the giant West Antarctic ice sheet and the Greenland ice sheet have been melting for quite some time, this NASA co-authored paper in the Geophysical Research Letters Journal that draws on their decades of observations and analyses shows that the melting can't now be reversed and it's well into a runaway phase that has the potential over the coming centuries to raise sea levels by more than a metre. Now, it doesn't sound a lot, but consider the impact of the waters through London or around Manhattan being four feet higher, and then think about the already flood-prone expanses of Bangladesh or the islands of the Maldives. You know, Maldives are only one and a half metres above sea level on average anyway. And with 159 billion, that's with a B, tons of ice melting each year consider miami and large areas of florida at only 12 feet above current sea levels parts of the netherlands and new orleans are already below sea level protected by levees and dikes that hurricanes all too frequently show are far too vulnerable and then there's the fact that with that huge reflective expanse of ice sheet gone less sunlight gets reflected back into space and the runaway heating goes up another level you see how it becomes a spiral and I know this is a contentious issue, so for clarity, and I don't even know why we feel the need to do this, but here's our stance so that we don't have to go through this rigmarole every time we mention anything connected with climate science. We go where the scientific consensus takes us. The most unanimous verdict of climate scientists says that the world is warming and that humans are largely responsible through the release of carbon into the atmosphere. Even the majority of the less than 3% of climate scientists who disagree accept a minimal influence of human-related carbon release. Now, if the scientific consensus were reversed, we'd happily adopt the stance that humans don't have an effect on global warming and that climate change isn't a concern or, or even real. This isn't a belief system or a religion for us. We accept overwhelming scientific consensus, whatever the subject. And we're not getting into arguments over this, it's not open for debate, and we're not preaching anything. But the stance of this show is that climate change is happening and humans are causing it, or at the very least advancing its progression. 
and you can take it that that's the default position here. Now that the scope for ignoring it on the show, well, it becomes slimmer and slimmer as climate sciences have become ever more entwined with planetary science and astrobiology. You know, we need to know about how climate affects the landscape and habitability on Earth to understand where life could exist or could have once existed on other moons and planets to get us better at identifying where and how to explore these other places. Having said that, we lost our atmosphere and lovely warm seas here on Mars a long time ago and living underground to avoid the harsh environment on the surface, well, it's, it isn't so bad and we'd quite happily watch Earthlings destroy themselves slowly. Like frogs in a pot. But luckily for our entertainment, you're less likely to go the way of Mars. You'll make your atmosphere thicker and hotter with a runaway greenhouse effect, so it's going to be more like stifling Venus where it's 460 degrees Celsius and it rains sulfuric acid. Anyway, sweet dreams. And on that pleasant thought, it's time to turn away from the news and have a look at this month's five-minute concept, where we delve into a bit of stellar size envy. Oh, Oh, there, there. Oh, yeah, 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 got that. The sun is hot. Really hot. Its surface is shade under 6,000 degrees Kelvin. The tenuous corona that we see so beautifully revealed at total eclipse hits over the million degree mark, while the sun's core is a scorching 15,700,000 degrees. All fueled by hydrogen fusion, creating helium, creating radiation and losing 4.21 billion tonnes of mass a second, the sun is truly awe-inspiring. And hot. But imagine that these figures are nothing special. Imagine that actually 6,000 degrees is pretty cool. Consider the vast envelope of the Sun, able to contain a million Earths, and imagine it's not really all that big. Star size is really something beyond human grasp. In all honesty, we barely comprehend the scale of our own planet, let alone something the size of the Sun. Human eyes have never ventured further than the bit of space just behind the Moon. We've yet to really confront in close reality the immensity of our nearest star. And yet we know that the Sun is nothing special in the ranks of stellar size. The Sun is special to us, but move more than a few light years away, and it quickly fades into the background. A distant alien observer would pass over it, as any of us would do looking at an eyepiece full of field stars. A star that we very much don't see as a field star is Sirius, the dog star. Blazing away in Canis Major and the brightest star in the night sky, Now here is a star that starts to put the sun in its place. Twice the mass, 25 times the luminosity, and a surface temperature approaching 10,000 degrees Kelvin. But Sirius, while bigger than the sun, is bright because of its relative proximity at 8 light years away. Spiker, on the other hand, is over 260 light years away, and is still the 15th brightest star in the sky. Here is a star that is over 12,000 times more luminous than the sun is over 10 times the mass, and has a surface temperature of 22,400 Kelvin. The Sun begins to sound positively polar, but Spica is by no means the biggest, not by a long shot. Four years ago, the bar was raised to an extent that surprised even the most visionary of stellar astronomers. A team from the University of Sheffield, led by Professor Paul Crowther, unearthed a monster. Buried in a star cluster called R136 inside the tarantula nebula of the Large Magellanic Cloud, they found a star so massive that it defies human comprehension. Star 136A1 is bright, 8,700,000 times more luminous than the Sun. R136A1 has a mass around 265 times that of the Sun's. R136A1 has a surface temperature in the region of 53,000 Kelvin. R136A1 is losing mass at a staggering billion times faster than the Sun on stellar winds of 2,000 kilometres a second. Our 400 kilometre a second solar wind seems almost breeze-like. R136A1 is what is known as a wolf rayet star a form of massive star that have come to intrigue astronomers, defying as they do the physical limits of star formation, a limit that physics suggests is set at the 100 to 150 solar mass mark. R135A1 is 265 solar masses and losing mass. Once upon a time, 
it was thought to be around 320 solar masses. The best explanation so far is stellar merger between massive stars. But we should be satisfied with our little sun. Life around a wolf rayet star would likely be impossible, if indeed planets can ever form around such turbulent stars. And the cooler, more sedate sun has something else going for it too, longevity. Current predictions give us a 10 billion year life for the sun, making our star middle-aged. Its consistency and age have allowed life and ultimately us to flourish. If the sun had been a wolf rayet, the show would already be over. R136A1 is thought to be just 2 million years old and already leaving the main sequence. It will bloat and swell, lose mass, but ultimately it's thought that two possible fates await. The first is that before core collapse occurs, the star will tear itself apart, forming a great swathe of element-rich interstellar medium. The second fate is a hypernova, an explosion a hundred times greater than a supernova and creating almost instantly a black hole. From stellar ignition to black hole in less time than the formation of the solar system. Well, as a treat this month, we don't have an interview, but we do have highlights of Chris Lintot's talk at AstroCamp. Um, this was an excellent talk he gave in the pub, and here it is. Now, um, most of you have probably heard me witter about such stuff in one format or the other before, but I'm an astronomer because I was a kid who grew up looking at the sky. There was a, a next door neighbour of mine had a small telescope and when I was 10. Um, I remember looking at Arcturus, of all things, one of my first views through a telescope, uh, and thinking that it was Saturn, because it's the same colour, uh, and being impressed, although disappointed that I couldn't see the rings. And then the next night we went out again and I got to see Saturn. But I, I came at this uh, very much as an amateur astronomer. I still consider myself a, a very amateur observer. I still have the same little six-inch telescope that I had when I was a kid. But when I grew up, I, I was thinking, I, I, I thought I'd missed the golden age of astronomy because the things that everyone, all the adults I knew were excited about were things like the Apollo missions. Now, none of you look remotely old enough to remember the Apollo missions. You're all clearly, oh, you're looking very good for your age, sir, and you're the only one that admitted it as well, which is, you know, too, it's too late now. It's too late now. Well done. Um, uh, but I thought, you know, that was the golden age of uh, exploration, but actually that was the golden age of space flight. We haven't quite touched that yet, but in terms of understanding the universe, what's happening now is really quite remarkable. Uh, and that's true wherever you look. If you stick within the solar system, uh, particularly the results we're getting from Curiosity and from Opportunity, the rover that's still uh, alive on the surface after 10 years, uh, are teaching us that Mars is a much more interesting place than we thought it was even 20 years ago. You know, there's this joke that NASA discover water on Mars about every year, uh, and it does feel like that. But what we're getting is a detailed picture of a planet that really was once Earth-like, that had an atmosphere thick enough that it could have oceans. Those oceans, we now know, in some parts, were at least the right sort of water. They weren't acidic. You could have picked up a glass of Martian water and drunk it. Um, you know, we know that what the Curiosity team rather wonderfully calls schnops, the things that you need for life, the sulfur, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and phosphorus, the basic building blocks uh, of life and advanced chemistry all existed on Mars, and we didn't know that two years ago. So there's a really, really exciting sense that the solar system is replete with habitats for life. You've got Mars, of course we saw just in December the discovery of a plume of water uh, being emitted from uh, Europa, from Jupiter's large moon, which clearly has an ocean uh, underneath it. Now, all right, it's a, it was a one-off observation. We saw water emitted from Europa once. Uh, but in astronomy, that's good enough. We're convinced it happens a lot. Uh, we have an ocean down there that maybe one day we'll explore. And going out to the Saturnian system, we've got Enceladus, uh, where we know that not only is there an ocean inside that little icy moon, we know that that ocean is in contact with rock. In other words, there's a sea floor within Enceladus. So uh, the kind of environment where life got started on Earth, we think, you know, a deep ocean, uh, some sort of activity coming up from the crust, probably exists 
inside Enceladus. And Enceladus really is spraying its water out into space so that we can sample it without having to dig down under the ice. We can just fly through it and do experiments. Um, I already mentioned Cassini, of course, uh, and just the images that we're getting from Saturn are teaching us about the dynamics of the planet nowhere near as boring as, as it looks. I don't know about you, but at least the first glimpse through a telescope, you see Saturn as a ball of any concentrate on the rings. It's now clear that it's a very dynamic and interesting place. And the rings prove to be much more complicated than anyone expected. And that's exciting because we want to understand Saturn's rings, but it's also exciting because that's a really good model, an analogue for the kind of thing that happens in the early days of a solar system. One of the patterns that we see in the universe is that the same patterns recur again and again and again. And so what you see happening in the rings of Saturn with little clumps of material coming together, migrating through the rings, and perhaps even forming into new moons, which we think have been seen in the last couple of, couple of weeks, is a pretty good match to what must have happened in the disk of material around the Sun, which led to the formation of the planets in our solar system. And there, of course, the, when I'm talking about a golden age of astronomy, the progress in discovering extrasolar planets, planets around other stars, has been absolutely immense. In 1995, or 1992, depending on how much hindsight you want to use, we discovered the first sensible planet around a normal star. Um, and we're now in a position where we know of, depending on how you count them, somewhere between 1,000 and 3,000 planets around other stars. So we know that all the stars that you see, all, we know that most of the stars you see when you look up from a nice dark site like this one, when it's clear, and we know that all, almost all the stars that you see have planets, and that planets are a thing that the Milky Way does extremely well. You know, we could have been on a rare example of a solar system, but we're not. Solar systems are common. Earth-sized planets is becoming increasingly apparent and common. Um, and planets in the habitable zones, or actually let's use the, the term for the Goldilocks zone, the bit that's not too hot and not too cold around stars, are incredibly common. Maybe you, you could argue that if you're an optimist, if Carl Sagan, of course, always believed that there'd be billions and billions of planets out there, but we now know that to be a fact. In an estimate, you can at least uh, bet a reasonable amount of money on, uh, is that there are about 17 billion Earth-like planets, by which I mean rocky planets this size in the Goldilocks zone, 17 billion in our galaxy alone. Now that number is probably somewhere between 10 and 30 billion, but it's a lot. There's plenty of spaces for life out there, and by studying these new solar systems, some of which look like miniature versions of our own, there is Kepler 186F, announced just the other day, uh, which is the fifth planet in a system in the habitable zone, uh, but actually, because its star is fainter, it's as close to its star as Mercury is to the Sun, but its temperature uh, would be about the same as the Earth is today, or at least this bit of the Earth. Um, so so we, 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 it, we're interested in these other solar systems because... Uh, they tell us about planet formation, but also they begin to tell us about whether our system is special. Um, there are still some things that are unique about our solar system. We haven't managed to pin down the number of moons around these planets. It's a much harder thing to do to spot an exo-moon, a moon around an exo-planet, uh, but we, nonetheless we haven't managed it yet, so it may be that the moon makes the Earth special. We haven't managed to look for what I'd call proper Jupiters, we found plenty of Jupiter-sized planets, but we haven't found a Jupiter in a Jupiter-like orbit, one that takes of order 10 years to go around its star, and that's just because you have to wait. So, you know, if, if we detect these planets indirectly, we do that over many orbits, and at the minute, we have no real way of understanding whether Jupiter is unusual or not. Um, so there are still some holdouts for our solar system being special, um, but we're beginning, this is becoming a science. It's no longer a speculation about what might exist. And science fiction writers of the future 
now have a large range of potential uh, sets for their movies and their writing. We don't have to pretend that there's a planet around Vega. We know there's a protoplanetary disk there. We don't have to uh, imagine Tatooine with two stars in its sky. You could set it around Kepler-65 if you want to. Um, we do need to fix the naming. It's a silly point in some ways. You know, it, it gets a laugh to talk about the naming of these things, but I think by giving these things names... We're rec it helps me at least to think of them as worlds, right? They're not just data points, they're not just um, hypothetical planets. This is a place that has a surface, probably has an atmosphere, it may have continents or ice or, or water or aliens or, or, or whatever, but once you think they're giving it a name, that becomes a lot more real somewhere deep in my brain. Um, and I think that's exciting. Of course, you could go further. Um, we're in the delightful position for scientists of having a model of the universe as a whole and its history that fits all of the data that we have. We have this idea that the universe began with a Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago, a number which we know more accurately than we know the age of the Earth. Um, I like to claim sometimes that's because astronomers are better than geologists, uh, which may or may not be true. Here we have some geologists in the house. It's actually a reflection of the fact that the early universe is quite a simple place. If you want to understand the cosmology of the universe, the, its history on a large scale, then you don't need to worry about messy stuff like chemistry, uh, or indeed most of physics. A bit of gravity will get you a long way. and uh, We can write down the equations that govern the large-scale structure of the universe on the back of a, a reasonably sized envelope. But this model of the universe that fits and explains what we see forces us to accept that 96% of the universe is in the forms, in forms of matter and energy that we don't understand. So most stuff in the universe isn't made of hydrogen, helium, isn't made of protons or neutrons, it's made of dark matter. And we don't know what dark matter is. And most of the energy in the universe... I don't know what dark matter is, do you? You can't see dark matter, that's true, but maybe you'll discover what it is and then you can tell us about it. That would be great. <laughs> we won't know for a while. Well done. I think that's great. So we won't know for a while what dark matter is. Um, and even worse than that is dark energy, which is this uh, accelerating force, an anti gravity force. And 70% of the energy in the in the universe today is made up of dark energy, and we don't understand that at all. So we're in this great position in which speculation is allowed, 96% of the universe is unknown, um, all crazy ideas are welcome, um, but we have new instruments and new observations to test those ideas against, and we saw that with the remarkable result, if it's true, from the BICEP2 uh, detector. Um, which looked at the cosmic micro background, the light that was emitted 400,000 years after Big Bang, and found a signature of something that happened uh, approximately a 10 million trillion trillion trillionth of a second after the Big Bang, this sudden rapid expansion of the universe, which two months ago I would have told you was an exciting theoretical idea with no evidence whatsoever to support it, and which now looks like it's something that we can measure and talk about sensibly which also allows us to test our theories of physics and so on. But this is now getting to the obscure end uh, of a talk that began with thinking about what Mars was like as a place. Um, so that should give you a range of things to ask questions about. So I don't know whether... Yeah. What would I recommend for people to look at at a star party? So I had their first star party. Well, cloud is exciting, <laughs> obviously. Um, you'll notice a lot of people looking at cloud and other people. The first thing I would do, if it's your first star party, is look through other people's telescopes. So there are some very friendly people here. So I, I would wander from place to place and make sure you look at what everyone else is looking at. Um, the thing I, I've enjoyed best here is actually, I think, the binocular views of the sky from a site this dark are the most surprising thing. I'm always impressed when you look through a big telescope. We've got Mars and Jupiter and Saturn this evening, which is great. But I think being able to just take your binoculars and, and, and surf the sky 
uh, especially from a dark side, is, is incredibly surprising. Uh, I, I'm going to I'm going to try and find a few of the galaxies in Virgo and Coma, which are just about which should be just about binocular visible, but I've never seen them in binoculars. So that's my plan. Uh, but yeah, steal off other people. Like, that, then do the hard work of finding stuff. Um, look through the telescope, then ask them how they found it, and then you learn and get the view as well. So that was the shortened version of Chris's talk at Astro Camp, and if you want to hear the full version with more audience questions to Chris, it'll be out soon as a podcast extra. So now it's on to the part of the show where you're in control and you ask us the questions and we give the answers. And there's only one question this month as we're going to go back to our meteor watch for the first Camelopard Alids. And it's from Darren Knight in Cambridgeshire. And he says, question for the podcast. If the Earth was the size of a flea, what animal would equate to the largest star known to man? We get some really good questions from <laughs> Darren, and I can't remember if this is the second or the third question of his that we've looked at, but while we only get interesting questions, Darren's always something we can get our teeth into, so thanks for this one. Um, well, we'll start with the size of a flea. Now, it's not something we want to dwell on for too long, and we'll all start itching just thinking about it, but their sizes can vary widely from one species to the other and how long they get to feed off their hosts, but generally their sizes range from small one millimetre dots that we're familiar with to as large as three or four millimetres. Then at the other end of the scale we have the stars and the biggest of them all, or the largest that we know of, is UY Scuti, which is burning away 7,800 light years from our sun in the constellation Scutum with a radius 1,708 times that of our Sun. So we can do some simple maths because we know that the Sun's radius is 109 times that of the Earth. So 109 times 1,708, which is how many times bigger the largest star is than our Sun, and that gives us 186,172. So we're looking for an animal 186,000 times larger than a flea. And if we take the more common flea that's around one millimetre, we're looking for an animal that's 186 metres long. So we've got a problem because no animal exists or has ever existed even close to that size. Oh, we can just sort of start seeing the dust lane through Cygnus. Marvellous. The blue whale's the largest animal around today, and that grows to about 30 metres, so you need to get six whales laid end to end to get to your size comparison. The largest animal we can be sure existed from the fossil record is the giant Diplodocus or Brontosaurus-like dinosaur called Amphicoleus, which lived around 150 million years ago and grew, we think, up to 60 metres long. Oh, there was something there. Are you, oh, I'm missing all these. Going that direction. Dimmer, but... Similar speed moving as well to that, that really bright one. Carry on. So placing the Earth next to UY Scuti would be like placing a flea next to three of these monster dinosaurs head to tail. But for another example of just how huge the largest star is compared to the Earth, let's take the average human height. And in this comparison you can forget the Empire State Building at 381 metres tall and Comet Eisen at a kilometre in size. You can even forget the combined size of both of Mars's moons that amount to around 30 kilometres. If you were in New Mexico that would be the difference in size between the Earth and the largest known star, you compared to New Mexico. OK then, well that was Darren's question answered, and now we're over here with John and Damien, and we're having a look at... Well, what's this called? It's an oscilloscope. And at the moment... Oh, we've got some spikes. Tell us, John, why, is, why are there two lots of spikes? Why are they on each side of the screen? Uh, depending on the reflections from the radar, the ones that are to the left with a shorter wavelength are reflections that are travelling towards us, and the ones on the right have a longer wavelength and therefore moving away. So that's actually Doppler measurements. Yeah. We're getting the reflections that are showing us things that are actually moving towards us or moving away from us. Yes. Wow. Oh, there we go, one straight from above, Cassiopeia heading towards Lyra. That was, I would say, probably about magnitude two, lasted for about a second and a half. Beautiful. 
Ezra. 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 Right. And what's our rate at the moment? What do you think we're we're getting? Well, let's take a count, shall we? Yeah, let's just get a count right here. Okay. And of course, this is the first ever Camelopardalid meteor shower because this is where the Earth is moving through the debris trail that's been left by uh, Comet 209P Linear for the very first time. This uh, this comet has actually made lots of orbits around the Sun before, but this is the first time that Earth's actually passing through its debris trail. So we are getting to see, or we're hoping we're going to be seeing a really bright meteor shower, a meteor storm, hopefully, when it peaks. And um, a lot of the reports have suggested it could be as many as 400 meteors an hour, which would be an incredible shower. And tonight, as we've been looking, we've already seen quite a few of these meteors um, of various brightness. We've seen a couple of fireballs, and we've seen uh, a few others that have been a lot dimmer. But, of course, with the oscilloscope, we're seeing everything even the really small motes of dust that we aren't being able to see with the naked eye or rather we see in the ionized trail yeah, of yeah. them as they're coming into the atmosphere and i think john's just doing a count now he's just he's timing a minute and we're just he's just counting the spikes on the oscilloscope so in a moment we will uh well there's there's his timer <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh and what's the count john what have we got in a minute uh, that was about 12. Oh well, twelve. Twelve a minute. So, yeah. so well, that's about two every ten seconds. One every five seconds. Yeah, uh, which is a bit, bit lower than we were getting earlier on. So I think we had it was about uh, we're about twenty-two earlier on. Yeah, earlier in the evening we had about twenty-two. So we 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 dropped a little bit, but still a, a pretty darn good rate. So yeah, that's looking at well, it's over seven hundred, seven hundred twenty an hour ZHR. I mean, but I mean that's not. An official say because it's these are not entirely visible. All these meteors are they? These are these are just from the radar. Yeah, um, there's no way of actually verifying what we're seeing on the radar compared to what's actually out there because as yet we've not seen a meteorite and a peak at the same point. A very difficult thing to do, isn't it? Look at the oscilloscope and look at the sky simultaneously. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and it's a testament to your engineering there, John, that we're looking at the oscilloscope and we can see peaks shooting off on this, um, well, almost every second. And I suppose we should stress that um, while we're seeing these peaks, this isn't necessarily ones that are bright enough for us to see with the naked eye. These are, well, it's the ionised debris trail that follows in the wake of a meteor and the reflections that are bouncing off them. And this will be everything that comes through the atmosphere, whether it's bright, whether it's dim, or whether it's invisible to the naked eye as well. Oh, there was one going through a major. There we go, just going through the, through the bowl of the plough there, actually. How bright would you put that? Oh, over magnitude one, I would have thought, actually. It was, it was, it was a, a bright flash. It really does help when it's yeah. nearer to the zenith, doesn't it, where the atmosphere is thinner, so you can, um, you can really see it brighter. Yeah, quite a short trail. It was, it was, it wasn't, probably didn't even do the width of the bowl, actually, but uh, that was good. So Damien, you said earlier that you were going to be taking some images tonight. What kit have you been using? So I'm using um, an ASI 120 monochrome planetary CCD camera that comes with a uh, fisheye lens. So that fisheye lens would be good for being able to cover the whole sky, I Exactly. Guess. It, it turns the, the planetary camera into essentially an all-sky camera. Ideal for catching meteors. Absolutely. So what I've done is to hook that up to my computer and using uh, Fire Capture, I've set it up to take um, a series of three second exposures throughout the night. Fire Capture being some free software that you can use to Absolutely. to plug a camera into. Exactly. Um, so it's taking a series of three second exposures throughout the night, spaced nine seconds apart, mm -hmm. and hopefully that allow me to, to catch uh, some images of meteors. Mm -hmm. And um, I can then turn those into um, a time-lapse animation of, of the night. And taking a look at the images so far, how, how do you think you've fared on catching any of them? Well, timing seems to have been a little off. <laughs> We've seen a few, but um, the, the captures have been just slightly off by a few seconds. Uh -huh. um, so none at the moment. We've got some satellites trailing through <laughs> and uh, the odd bit of fluffy cloud that's pass through the uh, the sky tonight but um, hopefully we'll be able to catch some and uh, as the night progresses if the uh, the rate increases then the the odds are better that we'll we'll catch something and we've got all night so we're just going to persevere exactly so of course it's, it's probably worth talking about exactly what what are meteors mm. and, and 
we see we say that it's the it's the the trail left the debris left by 209p linear um but what is it exactly well i mean most meteors are actually just pretty much the grains of sand like dust left by the, the comet as it ablated around the sun and it was leaving you know a great tail behind it the volatiles have gone but what's left are those little bits of silicate yeah and these are often a lot smaller than you'd expect them to be you, you kind of think that if you're going to see them burning up in the atmosphere that they're going to mm. be really big stones that are falling through the atmosphere yeah. and you hear about the meteorites um, that are discovered and they're not i mean you know the sort of at best you know a reasonably bright meteor is is going to be only something like sort of you know the gravel on your driveway you know it's it's only mm. little tiny fragments and it's actually even some you know those those little bright ones you see those quick flashes are going to be little sort of sand like grains there's there's nothing you know to yeah. them really it's more the velocity that they're traveling at that gives them that energy to heat up and um, and give off the light rather than the actual size yeah, absolutely. I mean, on the, the maths, I think we, we mentioned this earlier, the maths we were doing earlier with this oscilloscope, I mean, we were looking at 14 to 15 kilometres a second. Mm, that's which a lot of energy that's got, is to, a, yeah, I mean, you it's know, got to lose as it's coming through the atmosphere. A grain of sand travelling at 15 kilometres a second is, you know, it, it's a lot of punch um, for a grain of sand. I mean, if you imagine if you've ever stood on a, on a beach on a windy day and you get that sand sort of blasting into your face and you think, you know, you think that hurts. <laughs> <laughs> imagine imagine that sand travelling at 15 kilometres a second. I mean, and that's not particularly fast for um, comet debris. Actually, this is this is one of the, sort of, we think it's sort of slower meteor showers. Yeah, we think the particulates are, are generally bigger than in most meteor showers, but travelling quite a bit slower. So you've got that kind of balance, that trade-off between mm. velocity and mass that has to burn up in the atmosphere to give you a nice meteor shower. And of course, it's the first time we've ever seen a Camelopard Alice meteor shower. So we really don't know what to expect until tonight when we're watching them. Yeah, and, and I mean, we can tell a lot from the types of trail that are left behind. The colours, um, I mean, if you've ever watched a meteor shower, you, you sort of look more closely, you'll notice some of the, the, the trails actually leave a, a sort of colour behind them. Um, and this is sort of indicative of, of what the, the meteor was actually made of, and this, this sort of gives us clues as to um, what the comet was was made of, where it's you know, sort of the composition the, of the, the composition of it exactly. Um, and we, we're getting some really nice spikes now. We're getting sort of it's, it seems to be. Here we go. Look, one, two, three. Both sides four, of the oscilloscope. Both sides. Yeah. Yeah. We've got them moving Five, yeah, towards and away, and some that are, that are lingering. That's the ionized trail yeah. left behind. The reflections bouncing off of those. Yeah, we've actually got we've actually got a bit of cloud at the moment that's just sort of rolling in with a sort of patchy cloud. But actually, where the oscilloscope's going a bit 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 crazy at the moment. We're sort of getting look. There's. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, look that at that. Just it's earlier, <laughs> when we were looking at it, and before it was dark, you know, we had the oscilloscope that was showing us things mm. that we wouldn't be able to see with the naked eye because it was light. And now we've got it being able to show us things that are happening up there in the atmosphere when the clouds there and we yeah. couldn't see yeah, with the naked I mean, we're, eye. We're one, two, three. I would say the activity looks like it's picking up at the moment. Yeah, it's, it's certainly going in burst, isn't it? As mm. you'd expect mm. with meteor showers. Yeah, I mean, the trail of debris is not going to be sort of uniformly consistent. No. It's going to be patchy, and the sizes are not really not going to be sort of uniformly spread through the debris trail either. So, you know, there will there will be, you know, sort of not a not a uniform. I mean, if everyone's ever watched a meteor shower, it's it's, it's not a predictable thing. You can't you don't see a meteor then think, well, you know, I can I can look down for for ten seconds before I have to look back. It's and that's a, it's worth noting that because lots of people will go out for the very first time to watch a meteor shower and become a little bit disenchanted by it because it's at a, a, a lull period. Mm. But it really is worth sticking around for any of the, the major meteor showers because, you know, they do go in fits and spurts. And when they do start to raise these zenithal hourly rates, they really are just mm. stunningly spectacular sights. I, I mean, I'm just watching the oscilloscope now. And I mean, we, there's a little period there. We were getting, we were getting a peak every Probably about every second there, yeah. just for a moment, weren't we? I yeah. mean, it's you're getting little bursts there that were really quite energetic. It's a shame we've got this this bit of cloud cover actually, because we are really dark now, and I'm sure we should start seeing more. I mean, it is breaking up up there a bit, but uh, yeah, I mean, the oscilloscope's going absolutely nuts at the moment. <laughs> Okay, well, we're sitting here reclining, uh, which is, is the best way to, to look up at meteors because, I mean, it's to uh, avoid that crick in your neck. Um, yeah, find a sun lounger and, yeah, uh, and, and just get it looking in the direction of the sky where the radiant is. In this case, it's 
out towards the north. Mm. Though that said, I mean, the meteors do appear in any part of the sky, mm. um, but you're sort of generally looking towards sort of the rough part of the sky where the radiant is, you know, it's, it's, it's probably more likely to see mm. certainly the meteors you're looking for. Because, of course, meteors happen all the time. I mean, I think on yeah. average you, you typically see a meteor in a, in a reasonably dark sky about every 15 minutes if you're sort of watching carefully. Just because there is that much debris that's floating around in the solar system, mm. those little grains of dust that are out there. And uh, it's probably worth talking about, you know, what, what do we mean by it? sort of the words meteor, meteorite? What's the difference? What, what do we mean by those? Mm. Well, we can start off with meteoroids first, and these are little fragments that break off from asteroids or, or bits of solar system debris that are mm. floating around. Yeah, and of course then you've got the word meteor, which is the smaller fragments, much sort of, I think we, we already mentioned talking to, to John Damien, that they're sort of little grains of sand, little sort of pebble-sized things, um, and it's a meteor when it, it hits the atmosphere of the Earth, and that's that's when, well, certainly you see it on something like our... A radar set up over there but visibly you see it as that little streak of light that, that mm. sort of shooting star the, you know, the traditional image of the meteor and that's what we mean by a meteor and then of course there's meteorite yes and a meteorite is those meteors that not only come through the atmosphere but they don't burn up entirely and there's some fragments that are left over that actually make their way down to the earth and a meteor can only become a meteorite once it's actually hit the ground and has been yeah, left there to be picked up or, a stone, or found yeah. a stone on the ground uh, or, or, or a chunk of metal yes indeed yeah and, and actually one of the clues to a lot of meteorites people say you know oh, is this this rock i found a meteorite often one of the the clues is their density, and actually mm. they're, they're, they're generally quite heavy objects for their, yeah. their size. I mean, a, a typical earth stone that you find just sort of laying around in your garden actually tend to be quite light. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of air inside stones. Yeah, and, and one of the, the clues is that you know, a, a meteor or a meteorite will not have those pockets of air mm. inside because they have actually have broken up as it, as it entered the atmosphere at those mm. sorts of speeds and temperatures. So typically they're very solid. And often scorched as well. You yeah. can see scorch marks on them, or the way that, particularly if it's metal, the way that it has been, uh, used the word ablated earlier, mm. the way that it's burnt up as it's been coming through the atmosphere and the outer layers have melted and, in, yeah. in many cases, vaporised. Yeah, that's right. And if it's interesting if you, you actually find a meteorite that's that's freshly landed. I mean, what I find most fascinating about the, the idea of that is you think, oh, it'd be, you know, red-hot piece of metal or mm. red-hot rock. Actually... They cool down very quickly. Yeah. The inside of them, it could be close to absolute zero, can actually be very, very cold because it's... It's, it's spent so long out in space yeah, exactly. near that absolute zero temperature that it takes a, a, a lot of energy to heat it up yeah. and it will and only be heated up on the exterior, won't exactly. it? Exactly, and the few seconds of sort of passing through the, the atmosphere of Earth is not going to have heated it all the way through. So mm. actually they, they quite often land and they, if you, if you, you pick them up, um, and that, that does happen occasionally. They are they are found sort of fresh. They are extremely cold on the inside. One hour, <laughs> one hour two minutes, and we get a mag minus five point six iridium flare. Ooh, that's quite bright. In the northwest, so we'd see it here. Twenty two degrees up. So three hundred and twelve degrees. Just be, just be over the hedge. Oh yes, yeah. Okay, that's all we have time for this episode on our Meteor Special out here in the Wiltshire countryside under, well, frankly, quite stunning sky. Yeah, the, beautiful sky. The, yeah. the Milky Way overhead. So, I mean, we, we've seen meteors, we've seen them on radar, we've seen them visually, and, well, we're going to sit here and uh, enjoy the shower. Yeah. So, I hope you enjoyed the episode, and if you have any questions for our next episode, then do contact us through Facebook and Twitter and our email. And a reminder, if you want to join us in September at Astro Camp, which is the September the 20th to the 23rd, um, do visit the website at www.awesomeastronomy.com and follow the link to the Astro Camp website. So until next month, when we will be returning to Cydonia Base, it's goodbye from Wiltshire.
Awesome Astronomy is produced by Ralph Wilkins, Paul Hill, Damian Phillips, and John Wildridge, and is free to distribute for educational purposes. Music is courtesy of Star Salzman. For more astronomy news, views, help and advice, visit our website at www.awesomeastronomy.com. You can join in the astronomy discussion on our Facebook group, and you can follow us on Twitter at Awesome Astro Pod. We invite your questions to read out on the show. You can send them to us via Facebook, Twitter, or by email at the show at awesomeastronomy.com. We thank you very much for listening. From Cydonia Base, end of transmission. Let's be fair, let's do a bit of social media. Yeah. Look at that. Broke into six parts before it hit that village. <laughs> that church never stood a chance. That was the irony. <laughs> no, it was a stony one. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Try the veil. <laughs> <laughs> Bloody storm, 400 an hour. Yeah, there's at the peak. Yeah, yeah. say so we should be should be seeing. It's going to be 400 an hour in six hours. We probably should be seeing a lot more.